"You are cruel to him," Molly said. The Lady Amalthea did not look up. She was offering her opened palm to the crooked eared cat, but he stayed where he was, shivering with the desire to go to her. "Cruel?" she asked. "How can I be cruel? That is for mortals." But then she did raise her eyes and they were great with sorrow and with something very near to mockery. She said, "So is kindness." Molly Grew busied herself with the cooking pot, stirring the soup and seasoning it, bustling numbly. In a low voice she remarked, "You might give him a gentle word at the very least. He has undergone mighty trials for you." "But what word shall I speak?" asked the Lady Amalthea. "I have said nothing to him, yet every day he comes to me with more heads, more horns and hides and tails, more enchanted jewels and bewitched weapons. What will he do if I speak?" Molly said, "He wishes you to think of him. Knights and princes know only one way to be remembered. It's not his fault. I think he does very well." The Lady Amalthea turned her eyes to the cat again. Her long fingers twisted at a seam of the satin gown. "No, he doesn't want my thoughts," she said softly. "He wants me as much as the Red Bull did, and with no more understanding." "But he frightens me even more than the Red Bull, because he has a kind heart. No, I will never speak a promising word to him." The pale mark on her brow was invisible in the gloom of the scullery. She touched it and then drew her hand away quickly, as though the mark hurt her. "The horse died," she said to the little cat. "I could do nothing." Molly turned quickly and put her hands on the Lady Amalthea's shoulders. Beneath the sleek cloth, the flesh was cold and hard as any stone of King Hagrid's castle. "Oh, my lady," she whispered, "that is because you are out of your true form. When you regain yourself, it will all return, all your powers, all your strength, all your sureness. It will come back to you." Had she dared, she would have taken the white girl in her arms and lulled her like a child. She had never dreamed of such a thing before. But the Lady Amalthea answered, "The magician gave me only the semblance of a human being, the seeming but not the spirit. If I had died then, I would still have been a unicorn." The old man knew, the wizard. He said nothing to spite Haggard, but he knew. Of itself, her hair escaped the blue ribbon and came hurrying down her neck and over her shoulders. The cat was all but won by the eagerness of this. He lifted a paw to play with it, but then he drew back once more and sat on his haunches, tail curled around his front feet, queered head to the side. His eyes were green but speckled with gold. But that was long ago, the girl said. Now I am two, myself and this other that you call my lady, for she is here as truly as I am now, though once she was only a veil over me. She walks in the castle, she sleeps, she dresses herself, she takes her meals, and she thinks her own thoughts. If she has no power to heal or to quiet, still she has another magic. Men speak to her, saying, "Lady Amalthea," and she answers them, or she does not answer. The king is always watching her out of his pale eyes, wondering what she is, and the king's son wounds himself with loving her and wondering who she is. And every day she searches the sea and the sky, the castle and the courtyard, the keep and the king's face, for something she cannot always remember. What is it? What is it that she is seeking in this strange place? She knew a moment ago, but she has forgotten. She turned her face to Molly Grew, and her eyes were not the unicorn's eyes. They were lovely still, but in the way that had a name. As a human woman is beautiful, their depth could be sounded and learned, and their degree of darkness was quite discernible. Molly saw fear and loss and bewilderment when she looked into them, and herself, and nothing more. Unicorns, she said, the red bull has driven them all away, all but you. You are the last unicorn. You came here to find the others and to set them free. And so you will. Slowly, 
the deep secret sea returned to the Lady Amalthea's eyes, filling them until they were as old and dark and unknowable and indescribable as the sea. Molly watched it happen and was afraid, but she gripped the bowed shoulders even more tightly as though her hands could draw despair like a lightning rod. And as she did so, there shivered in the scullery floor a sound she had heard before, a sound like great teeth, molars grinding together. The Red Bull was turning in his sleep. I wonder if he dreams, Molly thought. The Lady Amalthea said, I must go to him. There is no other way and no time to spare. In this form or my own, I must face him again. Even if all my people are dead and there is nothing to be saved, I must go to him before I forget myself forever. But I do not know the way, and I am lonely. The little cat switched his tail and made an odd sound that was neither a meow nor a purr. I will go with you, Molly said. I don't know the way to the Red Bull either, but there must be one. Schmendrick will come too. He'll make the way for us if we can't find it. I hope no help from the magician, the Lady Amalthea replied disdainfully. I see him every day playing the fool for King Haggard, amusing him by his failures, by blundering at even the most trifling trick. He says that is all he can do until his power speaks in him again, but it never will. He is no magician now but the king's clown. Molly's face suddenly hurt her, and she turned away to inspect the soup again. Answering past a sharpness in her throat, she said, He is doing it for you. While you brood and mope and become someone else, he jigs and jests for Haggard, diverting him so that you may have time to find your folk if they are to be found. But it cannot be long before the king tires of him, as he tires of all things, and casts him down into the dungeons or some place darker. You do wrong to mock him. Her voice was a child's thin, sad mumble, and she said, But that will never happen to you. Everyone loves you. They had a moment to look at each other, the two women, the one fair and foreign in the cold, low room, and the other appearing quite at home in such surroundings, an angry little beetle with her own kitchen beauty. Then they heard boots scraping, armor clicking, and the gusty voices of old men. King Haggard's four men-at-arms came trooping into the scullery. They were all at least seventy years old, gaunt and limping, fragile as crusted snow, but all clad from head to foot in King Haggard's miserly mail and bearing his Y weapons. They entered hailing Molly Grew cheerfully and asking what she had made for their supper, but at the sight of the Lady Amalthea all four became very quiet and bowed deep bows that made them gasp. "'My lady,' said the oldest of the men, "'command your servants.' We are used men, spent men, but if you would see miracles, you have only to request the impossible of us. We will become young again if you wish it so. His three comrades muttered their agreement. 